Well, church, today is communion, so before we get going, I just want to remind you to get some elements prepared. I have my bread and my cup ready to go. I'd invite you to uh, get some elements prepared so that we can take communion together. And with that, let's begin our time of worship. I celebrate the Lord, his kindness towards us in giving us a wonderful weekend of weather. Happy Labor Day weekend. I pray that your rest and your family time is sweet and joyful. Let us gather before the Lord with a call to worship from Psalm chapter 16. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, and I have no good apart from you. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol nor let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and are at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Lord, teach us to agree with David. Teach us to trust in you. For truly, Lord, you are our chosen portion we have no good thing apart from you. In you is fullness of joy. And that is why we gather in your presence. That's why we gather to seek your face, to grow in our love and our commitment to you, to seek your counsel in the word of God. Lord, sharpen our faith, mature our walk. Let us be in tune with your spirit. And we do pray that your praise this morning might be magnified. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's worship the Lord in song. to the land 
Let's sing praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Well, church, I'd ask you to open up your Bibles to John chapter 17. Today we conclude our three-week look at Jesus' high priestly prayer. Jesus prayed for you. He prayed for me. And we see that beginning in verse 20 as we conclude the chapter. John 17, beginning in verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you've given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you've loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. May God bless his word to us as we conclude this third section of the Lord's prayer for us. Well, I see three things, and and we're going to be brief this morning, but I see three things here in the passage that I really want to leave us with, some action points that Jesus prayed to the Father and, and that we should be utilizing, activating, pursuing. If Jesus, in his last moments before arrest and death, spends time praying these things, these are super important for us to cling to. So the first thing I see in 20 through 23 is that we as Christians should be perfectly one. We should be perfectly one with believers and with God. In our super individualistic society where we cherish our independence, our rugged individualism, Jesus throws the gospel in our face. And he says, my purpose for coming and my prayer to my father is that you Christians would be perfectly united with each other. And he says that in verse 21, Jesus prayed that we would all be one. Not one with God, first and foremost, but one with each other. Look in verse 21. That they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they also may be in us. 
So he begins praying, Lord, would you make them one, that they all may be one with each other, and then that they may be all in us. And so God wants us to have a unity with one another, with the brothers and the sisters, that we Christians are to have this perfect unity. He even uses that perfectness in verse 23. I in them, you in me, so that they may be perfectly one. Perfectly one. And so I would just challenge you and encourage you, Christian, Jesus' last words before his death, his last prayer to the Father is praying that you and I would be in perfect harmony, synchronized, of one mind, and living out with one purpose, that we are striving for harmony with each other. This is a telltale marker of true Christianity. When people, when churches are fragmented and cliquish, when we're standoffish to certain brothers or certain sisters, we are slapping the Lord in the face. He prayed that our unity with each other would be like the unity that the Father and the Son share with each other. So Christian, are you united to other Christians as much as Father and Son are united to each other? Are you that close? Do you look with favor on your brothers and your sisters in the Lord? I like to joke about unity this way. Church, we are going to be spending eternity with each other. If we can't get along now, guys, we're going to be stuck with each other forever. So you might as well work out the wrinkles now. Break out the iron. Iron out all those wrinkles and live in tandem and in harmony with your brothers and sisters perfectly one. And Jesus prays to the Father this prayer. He mentions twice in the section the reason why he's praying this. He's praying this, verse uh, uh, 21, at the end of 21, so that, so, so there is a reason, there is an end result of Christian unity. He says, so that the world may believe that you've sent me. And he doubles down on that again, right? In verse 23, so that at the end of 23, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved me even as, uh, even as you loved me. So twice in the passage, 21, 23, Jesus's prayer for our common Christian unity is so that the world may know so that the world may know. I'm not dissing on apologetics. There is a place for that. Christians defending and proving the merits of our doctrines. There's merit in that. Defending creation against evolution. Defending the Christian view of one man and one woman in marriage till death do you part. The the Christian message of the cross. The Christian message of the the... Uh, the Holy Spirit dwelling in believers. One of the thir- first things that Christians defended was our view of communion, that we are not cannibals eating human flesh. It's bread and a cup reminding us of what Jesus did for us. It's a reminder, not cannibalism. And that was one of the first things that the the Latin Romans, the pagans, were accusing us of. And Christians defended themselves. And so all apologetics is good and noble, but one of the greatest defenses of our Christian belief, one of the most persuasive things that we can offer to a dying world is our harmony with each other. 
Friends, we see it in our own country even now, racial disharmony, political disharmony, and, and the fragmentedness of our, of our state. When one is ganging up against another and, and cries for justice and cries for harmony, in this world, there is never going to be a unity. But in the church, there is. And what a great offer of defense. What a great uh, thing that we, as we pursue Christian love for each other, Christian unity with each other, we show the world something beautiful that they will never have outside of faith in Jesus Christ. And so I would call you, actively contribute to Christian unity in our Whitehall Bible Fellowship Church, as well as in the broader community of faith in the Lehigh Valley, pursue the unity of brothers and sisters, regardless of which local church, we all claim the name of Jesus and we all bear that name and we need to have harmony with each other. Well, the next thing we see in verses 24 through 26 is a prayer that, that God, Jesus is praying that God the Father would reveal things to his followers. Reveal your glory. Reveal your name. Reveal your love. Let's show that in 24 through 26. Father, verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given to me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you've given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. So the first thing that Jesus asks the Father in our section here is, Father, reveal my glory to my children. Reveal my glory to my followers. I long, I desire, I love that he desires. He desires that we would be present with him. And just so you know, like they're with him right now in the upper room as he prays this. They're right there with him. But he's not thinking about that very moment. He's thinking about eternally. Why do I say that? Verse 11. So what does he pray? Okay, let's see it again in 24. I pray that they may be with me where I am. All right, so that's his prayer, that they may be with me where I am. Verse 11. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you, Holy Father, so keep them in your name. So what is, what is Jesus saying? He's saying, look, I'm looking towards that, that moment just a couple days from now when I'll be in your presence in heaven. And now he's praying, verse 24, I desire that they may be where I am so that you, Father, can show them my glory. One of the things that, that um, we need to understand is that throughout the Gospels, because a lot of the paintings get this wrong, the paintings show a halo around Jesus' head. And it's to give him his proper due, his proper glory. He is the king of the universe, and he is crowned with many crowns. And yet in his earthly incarnation, Jesus had no glory that we should look upon him. No, nothing physically about him drew humanity to him. And the disciples themselves often just thought, well, he is a good teacher and a good man and he loves us. And, and occasionally Jesus would pull back the curtain. Like when he calmed the storm and they're in the boat and he calmed the storm and Peter gets on his knees and they're, they're all worshiping him. And Peter says, I am a wicked man, depart from me. Another time he takes Peter, James and John to the holy mountain to pray. And on that lonely mountain, Elijah and Moses appear with Jesus. And the two of them, as well as Jesus, are shining in radiant glory. We call this the transfiguration. Jesus' figure was changed. But those are just occasional moments, occasional moments. And here, 
Jesus doesn't want it to be occasional any longer. He doesn't want your respect and appreciation and affection for him to be occasionally moved with wonder and splendor. He wants you to be present with him in heaven. I'm returning to you, Father, and verse 24, my prayer is that they might be where I am so that, Father, you can show them my glory. Jesus longs for his children to see him face to face in all his glory, in all his radiant splendor. And he actually spends time praying to the Father, asking that you and I would get to heaven. What a great thing it is to know that our Lord prayed for us, that the Father would receive us into heaven. What a great thing that is. And I'm trusting because Jesus asked it, I'm trusting that it's gonna happen. So praise the Lord, it will. The next thing I see in in 25 is um, a prayer for knowledge uh, of, of his name. Oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I've made known to them your name. And so Jesus makes... Uh, the Father's name known to us. He, He is praying that a greater revelation of God's name, a greater respect for God's name, a greater urgency to pursue that name and to know that Lord. So, so friends, Jesus prayed that we would know the Lord fuller and fuller and fuller. He's asking the Father, uh, help your children to know your name better. And finally, the verse 26 closes out, and that the love with which you've loved me may be in them. And so Jesus prayed, verse 24, uh, that the Father would reveal Christ's glory to us. He prayed, verse 25 and 26, that the Father would reveal his name more and more to us. And finally, the end of 26, that the Father would reveal his love for us more and more, that the love with which you've loved me may be in them. Jesus requests that the Father's love might be within us. So, O oh church, if Jesus spends time praying for these three things, Shouldn't we be open, interested, pursuing these three? Oh, Jesus, show us your glory. Give us a glimpse. We're expectant and hopeful that we'll see it face to face one day. We long to be at your side one day. But for now, show us a little bit of your glory. Let us get a glimpse. Let us get a picture. Let us get some anticipation for your radiant splendor. Oh, Lord, would you show us more about your name? There are things about you we wrestle with, we don't understand. We, we, we are trying to gain some measure of knowledge about you. Show us your name. Reveal to us your name. Your, your son Jesus asked this, and we join him in asking this. And Father, we humbly ask that you would show us more of your love, that we would feel loved by God. And Lord, that that as we receive love for you, we can now give love because uh, in this is love, not that we loved, but that God loved us. And so would you help us to love? May your love be within our hearts. So that is my prayer for you. That's, That's Jesus' prayer for you. And I think that we'll grow as we, uh, as we pursue those three things. So uh, a takeaway for you, thinking on God's name, I will cherish, I will revere God's name and God's reputation in my words and in my actions. Just in a simple way, some of us struggle with uh, using God's name carelessly. You stub your toe, you, things don't work out for you. And friends, we are lovers of God. Let us use our tongues to revere and respect his name, not to use it carelessly, not to say, oh my God, as so many careless Christians do, it's, it's wicked and we need to repent of that. And so I would just ask you, friends, 
I would ask you to cherish and revere God's name and to pursue that. And with your actions as well. You know, we're name bearers. With our behavior, God's reputation gets affected. The world sees our reckless living and they think, oh, they don't care about God's name. Why should I? And friends, we need to break ourselves so that God's name would be revered among the nations because of our life. And now we come to the close. Verse 26 uh, in the middle. Jesus says to the Father, I have made to the... Uh, let me start again. I have made known to them your name and I will continue to make your name known to them. And I just love how Jesus says, I will continue to make your name known. And let that be a rallying cry for us as Jesus prays that to the Father. Let, let that be our prayer to the Father. In our third point, verse 26, let us join with Jesus and say, Oh, Father, I, Tim Schmoyer, I, whatever your name is, I will continue to make your name known. Jesus said that to you, and now I'm saying that to you. And that needs to be our, that needs to be our rallying cry. You know, we are his followers, and we have Christ in us, verse 23. We have Christ in us, the end of verse 26. We have God's unity unifying us. We share in Father in Son, Son in Father, Father and Son in us, believers. We enjoy that. We experience that. We have his glory. We have heaven on our hopes and aspirations. We have God's knowledge, the knowledge of his name. We have God's love in us. We have all this in us. And so we need to dish that out. We need to let that light so shine so that people would bring glory to God through the life that we live. And so share this. Join with Jesus. I will continue to make your name known. And even if you've paused from that, Christian, even if you've refrained from doing that for, for reasons of embarrassment, rejection, whatever the reason, oh, friend, we have so much within us let it crack through. Let it break through. Let others see that greatness. They will receive God's love, God's unity, God's knowledge. They will receive the gift of heaven. They will receive Christ within them. If we share it, if we tell it out. And friends, let's, let's continue. Let's continue. If we've refrained, let's resume. If we've been doing this, Let's continue doing this. And so my, my call to action, I will join in Jesus' mission to make God's message known to the world. Jesus had that on his lips even to his dying day. Let it be so with us as well. Well, we've had a, a good time, a brief time in God's word, but a valuable time, compact I pray that this challenge would take you to the next step of faith, would lead you to a greater place with the Lord. Let me pray for you and with you. Oh Lord, we thank you for this role model we have in Jesus' prayer. Father, we just pray for the unity of your church, both this local church, Whitehall Bible Fellowship Church, as well as the greater church across the world. Lord, we are one because we bear one name, the name of Jesus Christ. Let it be so among us, Lord. Let it, let it reign. Let unity reign. How blessed it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Jesus, you prayed this for us. Let it come about and let us join you in striving to make it so. We pray as well, Lord, that you'd give us glimpses of your glory a greater understanding and appreciation for your name and greater love felt by your presence within us. We pray for this. Finally, Lord, we join with Jesus and we agree with him as we pray to you, Father. I will continue to make your name known. Let it, let it be in our lives that we make you known to people. And uh, with Christians, as we're having just common, everyday, normal conversations, 
Let us be quick to remind our fellow friends, our fellow believers of your precious name and your precious guidance from the word of God. Let's not be shy about that. Let's not think that we'd be too holy roller to share the name of Jesus with a brother or a sister. And then Lord, we pray for the world that we would make known God's name to the world. Jesus, help us with this. Spirit, remind us of our call to go out and to bear witness to what Jesus has done. Lord, we're, we're being sent out. We want to worship you in song. We want to conclude our time with communion. And as we do these things, let it be for your honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've had a great time in God's word. Let's prepare for communion by singing a song of worship to God together. Let's prepare our hearts for communion from Luke's gospel, chapter 22. I'll read verses 14 and following. When the hour came, Jesus reclined at the table. The apostles were with him. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, Take this, divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them. He said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, the cup after they had eaten He said, this cup is poured out for you as the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand that betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, asking which one was going to do this. And so Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper as we looked at a a little portion of that in John chapter 13 as Jesus gives uh, Judas this bread and dips his hand in the the cup, dips the bread together. And and so Judas eats that and runs away to betray Jesus. But listen, friends, Jesus needed to go to the cross because this bread and this cup aren't the real thing. They are a remembrance of the real thing. The real thing that secures your salvation is the body and blood of Jesus himself. As he hung on that tree, he secured our salvation. And your entrance into heaven was already purchased by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He secured it. It is fast in his hand. No one can pluck you out of his hand, as Jesus promises us in John chapter 10. And so with the joy of knowing that your salvation is secure in Christ, let us remember what he did on the cross. I'll ask you to take your bread. And again, as Jesus gave this bread to the disciples, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is my body. As you hold this bread in your hand, let us pray to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, we thank you for your broken body, that you uh, first gave this bread, broke it and gave it to your disciples, but then your body on the cross, that bread from heaven on the cross, how your flesh was broken for us. It was pierced through, it was marred with stripes, and by those stripes, our souls are healed. Thank you for the restoration from a dead life into a living soul, which you accomplished for us and in us when you died your death on the cross. So we eat this bread to remind ourselves of your brokenness for us, your perfection, which was broken by our sin. We celebrate our forgiveness. We celebrate what it cost you and we delight ourselves in you having paid the price. Brothers and sisters, let us eat this bread together. And then Luke's gospel tells us that then he gave them the cup. He said to them about this cup, this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant. And Jesus began a new arrangement between man and God. No longer the temple sacrifices going to a priest with a bull or a goat, but rather trusting in what Jesus did on the cross. His blood is spilt for us. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you for your blood, the blood of your new eternal covenant. As you've made a promise to secure our souls by the purchase of uh, of our souls by your blood. We pray that as we drink this, it would refresh us and rejuvenate us, clinging to what you've done, trusting in what you've accomplished. And we drink this to celebrate you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us drink the cup. Well, amen and amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining me. Let's cut over to some announcements and then we'll get you out of here. Well, church, it was a glorious time to be together. Thank you so much for joining me on our website this morning. Just a couple announcements we wanna go through and a reminder as we go through these announcements, these are all on our church news page of the website. If you are watching this morning from our church website, just scroll down and the news is all right there. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, go into the description. There's a link for church news. Click that and you'll get right to where you need to be. But just a couple things, a reminder that our life groups are running. Uh, my Sunday night and Wednesday morning classes are posted there on the website. We meet in Fellowship Hall. Each person has their own table and chair, and uh, it's a glorious time. We're social distance, but we're growing in the Lord, and we're spending time with each other. And I invite you to, to both of those. Sometime this month, in the near future, Pastor Smith will restart his uh, life group at the Mesa Connick's house. Uh, stay tuned for details on the start date for that. The men's uh, ministry, the men's study, uh, had their time this past Saturday at 8 a.m. to 9, and they meet every other week. So we're off this coming Saturday, and we'll be on again the Saturday after that. So what is that? The 5th, the 12th we're off, the 19th they'll meet again. So circle that on your calendar. Gentlemen, is God really in control? That's what you are talking about in men's group. Kids, we're excited to announce that in the month of October, we will be resuming uh, Awana for the calendar year. We're excited about what God's gonna do in our Awana students this season. 
parents, if you have kids uh, in preschool all the way up through teen, uh, we invite you to sign your kids up for Awana. You can use the church website to do that. Uh, under the activities tab is Awana, and the, the button to register is right there. Basically, what we're looking for is, uh, is for people to register. Uh, we're going to base some of our decisions as to how we're going to format the class uh, based on who registers. If we get too many registrations, uh, which is wonderful and good, we're going to run children every other week. Uh, so if, if there's a sizable group of registrants, we're going to have um, half the kids assigned to uh, w two weeks of the month, the other group the other two weeks of the month. And, and so we, we really want to run everybody uh, every week, but we need to base that on how many kids register. So sign your kids up for Awana, and we will be starting that in the month of October. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, again, all of that information and more is on the church news page of our website, and I invite you to turn there. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, and may the joy of the Lord be your strength.